Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I'll be joined on the line later today by Maria Mountain. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, I'm going to give you a very brief recap of the week that was, a little foresight into the upcoming holiday weekend, and what you can expect from this week's episode. So let's dive right in. Starting with last week, nothing too exciting going on. We are in the tail end of e-learning, which is very exciting. As I'm recording this, we have three days left. When you listen to this episode, I will be done with e-learning. So have a tasty beverage for my wife and I and all of the parents that have been on the e-learning train for the last two and a half months. It is, I mean, it's hard. It is, it is not easy. And, you know, obviously a tip of the hat to all the teachers that we have out there that take great care of our kids. But man, it's just even worse when you're combining staying at home with working from home with learning from home, you know, like I think it just really helps us to have these distinct spaces where we do these different things. And when one space becomes your everything space, it can lead to a lot of clutter, a lot of anxiety. So needless to say, shout out to all the teachers, but shout out to all the parents that have made it through the last couple months. Hopefully you're going to enjoy a tasty adult beverage this weekend and enjoy the fact that hopefully come here in a couple months, our kids will be back at school and we'll have some semblance of normalcy back in our lives. So that is that just thinking, you know, like what is this whole quarantine taught us? And I think one thing that it's taught me is very simply that there's more to life than just work. So, I mean, obviously I, I love my work as much as anybody and I, I miss it greatly when I can't be in it full time, but it has taught me, you know, to find some balance and find some pleasure in other things. So for me, the yard, I mean, I kind of get now why dudes, you know, older dudes and especially like back in the day, people enjoyed their yard so much. I find it, it's been very therapeutic. So, man, I killed it out there the other day. I was out there two and a half, three hours, of course, cleaning the dog poo, which is now my new starting job, but cut the grass, edged, trimmed. So I got those tight lines everywhere, blew everything off, looked really, really solid, grilled out that night. So, you know, whether it's the yard, whether it's the cooking game, like I've been really enjoying cooking. I made chicken breasts on the grill Saturday, Sunday, Ken and I made chicken parm, some green beans, some pesto bread, just fire. And then actually tomorrow night, her and I are going to go back at it and we're going to go chicken satay, this biryani rice and some roasted veggies. So, you know, it's just, I think it has taught me there's a lot of things that I enjoy doing outside of just the gym. And I think when I get to go back to the gym full time, that's just going to be amplified. So deep thoughts from MR there. One piece of bad news Unfortunately, we're like in this tug of war between the governor of the state of Indiana and then the mayor of Indianapolis. So if you look at where the gym is, we're right on the south side of 96th Street. So if we were on the other side of 96th Street, we'd be in Hamilton County. And if we're being real, like we could probably be open right now. Unfortunately, based on the fact that we are in Indianapolis, the mayor pushed back our date even further. So now our tentative open date is June 1, and he was very kind of abrupt about it. I mean, he basically said tentatively June 1, but no guarantees. So I'm just going to put it out there because by the time you listen to this, hopefully there'll only be a week left. Like, man, I've been taking a handful of people in the gym. Like my clients, my people that I know have to go be on a sporting field and potentially a couple of weeks. Like there is no way... I'm going to let them sit around and not be trained and show up out of shape and potentially get injured. So, man, I've been putting some work in and, you know, you can think what you want of me about that. I mean, I have the stringent, most stringent cleanup, teardown policies, like everything else is in order. But I mean, it's definitely opened my eyes to the fact that, man, there's some funny business going on for sure. Like when you can look around and people can be at a grocery store and a grocery store is probably not the best example but it still works, whether it's a grocery store, whether it's the Home Depot that's across the parking lot from us and there's 200 cars there every day and people are in there touching stuff, putting stuff away, touching stuff, putting stuff away. Like how is that any more safe than my gym where I can literally have a client, anything that they use, put it in the middle of the gym, wipe it all down. They sanitize their hands when they come in. They sanitize their hands when they come out. They're not near anybody else the whole time. It's like... 
I mean, this whole thing is kind of crazy. And obviously, there's some definite shady business going on, whether you're looking at, you know, like, for instance, the Colts get to open their facility this week, yet they're in Marion County, but we don't get to open our facility. You know, so there's just just funny business going on, and I'm going to try and look past it, but just crossing my fingers that June 1, we're back in the game, we're back at it, and not just me, but our entire staff, because look, we're all ready to get back in the game. We miss our clients. We miss working with people. Like, I think most trainers, if they're not extroverts, at, at the very least, they enjoy people. They enjoy working with people, and they enjoy interacting with people, so... I mean, I think I can very safely say from myself, from my staff, we're all ready to just get back in the gym and get to it. And, you know, if somebody doesn't want to come in or somebody's worried about COVID, like, I totally get that. Like, don't come into the gym. Like, we're not going to charge you. It's not like we're evil people and we're going to, you know, start charging you money because you're not coming into the gym. Like, I want people to feel safe first and foremost, but the people that want to be in the gym and that want to get back after it, I mean, we just want to get in there and, and get after it ourselves. So. Anyway, that is kind of where I'm at with life. Looking forward to this holiday weekend. If you listen to this before the holiday weekend, I hope you have an amazing time. Whatever it is you do, enjoy it. Be safe. Be happy. And a quick break, and we'll jump into this new show with the awesome Maria Mountain. One thing Bill Hartman and I have talked about for years now is the power of mentorship. Early on, I didn't have a mentor to shape or guide me. Or most importantly, help me find the blind spots in my own training and coaching. But luckily, after many years of trial and error, I found Bill, and my professional success exploded as a result. But the downside to the mentorship process, at least professionally, is that it can be pricey. For private mentees that I work with, it costs anywhere from $3.99 to $5.99 per month to work together. And while I know the results go far beyond that price, the fact of the matter is that just won't work for a lot of folks. So when Bill and I sat down a while back, we asked ourselves a really tough question. How can we help shape the future of the industry and truly make it great? And beyond that, how can we create amazing content yet make it affordable to virtually every trainer or coach out there? And the answer for us was simple. Restart iFast University. Here's what you'll get when you become a member of iFast University. One update each month from myself and Bill. This could cover anything from improving exercise technique to writing better programs and everything in between. Twice per month Q&As, where Bill and I will personally answer your questions to help you become better at training, coaching, or even running your fitness business. A Facebook group where you will be surrounded by like-minded trainers and coaches who are serious about getting better, and access to the iFastU archives, where you'll be able to watch literally hundreds of pieces of content from the iFast team over the years. This blend of content and Q&A is specifically designed to help make you the best trainer or coach possible. If you're interested in learning more, head on over to ifastuniversity.com to get signed on. We'd love to have you on board. A strength coach since 1994, exercise physiologist Maria Mountain has specialized in off-ice training for hockey goalies since 2002. She has traveled throughout North America and Europe, helping goalies of all levels and abilities reach their full potential, applying her inside-out approach to athlete development, a philosophy she has used to help athletes in a variety of sports win Olympic gold, the Stanley Cup, and world championships. In this show, Maria and I take a deep dive into the development of hockey goalies. We start with her assessment process and then talk about her inside-out approach. From there, we discuss how she lays out training programs, the things she has to put a premium or emphasis on, and then finish up with talking about how young females can make their own mark in and around professional sports. This is a really awesome show, and I know you're going to love it. But enough for me. Let's do this. Maria, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to chat. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Uh, for sure. My name is Maria Mountain. I'm from London, Ontario, and I'm a strength and conditioning coach. And, and I've been in that field for probably, I think it might be over 25 years now. Oh, but man. yeah, I specialize in off ice training for hockey goalies. And so that's, that's sort of it. I love it. I love it. What led you to the world of physical preparation? How did you get started in all this? 
Oh, geez, I, uh, the simple answer is probably I couldn't get into medical school. Okay. Um, I, <laughs> I was smart enough to flunk math in my first year of university. And, and so I, I could never make the cutoff to get into medical school. So I thought probably like a lot of, you know, phys ed grads, we were back in the day in 93 when I finished my undergrad that, well, I'll just work in a gym. Right. And so I, I actually, my, yeah, I did, I did. I worked in a gym and <laughs> it was a world gym you know, and like kind of thing, like you had to call in after eight o'clock at night, the night before to see what appointments you had the next day. And, oh man, okay. you know, it was like, it was nuts. It was sort of before personal <laughs> training, but, but that, that actually fed my passion to learn more about how the body worked and this idea of personal training. So I actually, I went, I got very enthused about, yeah, if you had a tennis player, we give you exercises to be a better tennis player. Cause at the time, and you would remember this time, it was like the machines. And as if yes. you were a personal trainer, you showed them how to adjust the machine. And <laughs> that, yeah. that was it. That was it. So I went to one of the, there was sort of one big chain in Canada and I, I went to a manager that I, that I had met before. And I said, you know, I'm really interested in designing specific programs for people to achieve their specific goals, not just running them through the machine. And, and she smiled, you know, patiently, like, a, you know, looking at this 23 year old kid and said, you know, that's a really nice idea, but our business is selling memberships. Okay. There we go. And so that day I, I applied to do my master's in kinesiology then and and learn more about how the body worked. And, and that's really how, how it all got started. I love it. I love it. So talk to us about, you know, going into this master's program, going through that. And then could you give us just like a short recap of your career path? Because I feel like you're kind of selling yourself short. 25 years of experience. I'd love to know kind of what happened in those 25 years. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I'll give you the quick version. So I, I actually, my first job was I worked at the gym and then I got a job as a kinesiologist working for a rehab company with people who'd been in motor vehicle accidents. And so that was a real experience yeah. in its own. From there, did the master's, uh, had a great experience with it. And it was at Western University here in London, Ontario, that has actually has a world renowned sport medicine clinic called the Fowler Kennedy Sport Medicine Clinic. One of my mentor... Dr. Fowler was one of the guys that pioneered ACL reconstructions. Mm. And so I was lucky enough to get hired there as the exercise specialist in the physiotherapy department. Just turned out that as I was finishing my master's, the guy who had the job was moving on to another university. And so I got to spend five years there, you know, learning how to rehab athletes and just had a lab <laughs> and a playground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was great. So from there, during my time there, I'd started my own business doing personal training as well on the side. So I'd work in the clinic from seven till three and then train clients from, oh, wow. you know, three until, you know, nine or 10 <laughs> at night. And, and I got like the university didn't have a strength coach. So, you know, the, the basketball, volleyball, track, hockey teams hired me, but it would be like, we can give you 200 bucks for the year. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> right. oh, awesome. Yes. You know, and then I got hired away to a, a velocity sports performance in town. That was a great experience because I always thought that would be my dream. Like it was a beautiful, like 30,000 square foot facility with yeah. a Mondo track. And, but then I learned very quickly what comes along with that and yes. how that is a volume business. Mm -hmm. So from there, I started Revolution Sport Conditioning which was, it was a small, you know, 1500 square foot facility that I owned until just this fall. And I sold it this fall after 15 years to, to the head coach, you know, that I had hired. So okay. that was actually really awesome too. And now I'm just online working with the goalies. I love it. I love it. So I'm really intrigued. It's one thing to get into a niche like basketball or soccer or hockey, but how do you niche all the way down into training goalies? How did that get started? When I started the online business... And when was that, it, just so we know? Oh, probably 12 or four, 14 years ago. Right. Like, yeah. It's so been a while, is what I'm it's getting been at. A, yeah, it wasn't like, I'm going to have... It was like before there were online. Like, yes. it was like crazy. So um, it was for all of hockey. Mm -hmm. 
And I really just started putting out content. I almost don't even remember why, you know, yeah. but I was just very yeah, enthusiastic and I'd had good success training hockey players. And so, and I always saw it and I didn't play competitive hockey growing up. I'm old enough that girls didn't play hockey. And, and oh, wow. even as a real tomboy, it never really occurred to me, like, I should be able to play ice hockey with the boys, you know, <laughs> right? it's like, I played road hockey, but not ice hockey. So, so I always kind of looked at it from, you know, biomechanics, physiology, anatomy perspective. And the goalie position is so fascinating. So I would just naturally, you know, come up with exercises and ideas and content for goalies as well. And I always got such a tremendous response because I realized nobody was talking about it. Yeah. And at that time, too, people would even like refuse to discuss like other coaches would refuse to discuss the topic with me <laughs> like wow. um, holy training and so so then probably about eight years ago or so I just decided you know what I, I just want to talk to the goalies and and really put everything I have into helping them because it's a lot like a baseball pitcher Mike like you know if they're not doing the right things they're gonna have trouble and and right. it could cut it or short. So, so that, that, and you know, goalies are a little like pitchers are a little different cats, but I just, I like, I love them. So yeah, I love it. I love it. So I come from Indiana and let's be real here. Hockey isn't <laughs> like a big thing here. We've got cornfields, a lot of basketball hoops, but not a lot of ice hockey rinks. So I didn't grow up like being around the sport and we didn't even have cable where I grew up. So I didn't get to watch the sport all that often. So could you tell me, and maybe anybody else who's unfamiliar, what physical traits does it take to be a good goalie? Like what physical skills or tools do they need to be successful? They need, they need a lot because, so it's interesting. So uh, if you're not familiar with hockey, like a skater, like a forward or defenseman, they'll go out in shifts and they'll kind of switch on the fly. It would almost be like basketball, but if the guy's just switched off every like 45 seconds <laughs> and, yeah. and, and another guy jumped on and, <laughs> and played. So, but that's kind of, controlled and and you sort of know like okay this yeah I'm gonna go out and do my shift and then I'm gonna get this rest well the goalie is on the ice the whole game and they don't know how long each shift is gonna be really so they're a repeat right. sprinter but you know when there's a when there's a penalty in hockey and, and there's a power play so then one team has all five of their skaters and the other team only has four so then you know the puck might be stuck in your end for a minute or it depends how good your team is, but, or right. two minutes or so, you know, you might be doing these, these repeat sprints that are anywhere from 10 seconds to two minutes. Yeah. And so they need that they, and they need the, the quick, quick power. So, so yeah. it's, it's not about big, big pushes. It's about, you know, very quick. We talk a lot about that one inch punch idea yes. that Bruce Lee, but moving like that, there's also a, like a vertical component because the goalies will go down on their knees to sort of flare out their pads to take away the bottom of the net. And so that I started playing actually on the ice about five years ago. And that's one of the biggest things like that is exhausting, like the up and down yeah. pattern. And then, you know, having the hand eye coordination, catching like pucks that are just, you know, being ripped at your head. And so it's, 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 and mentally they just, you know, they have to be, they have to be able to keep it together. And yeah, like it, it is, it's my sandbox and, and you know, you can probably see why it's like, yeah, I could spend my career playing in this sandbox. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So kind of along those same lines, coming back to you a little bit, talk to me a little bit about your inside out approach to athletic development. Yeah. So that's really what I learned when I worked at the sport medicine clinic. And you've probably had similar evolution when you started out, but when you are rehabbing an athlete who maybe it's a football player and they've injured their, they've had an AC separation or something. Well, you can't really work on the big stuff. You can't be like, okay, we'll do some bench press today. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you can't yeah. do the things they're used to doing to get strong, but you know, okay, well, we're going to work on your scapular positioning and, and we're going to work on your rotator cuff and we'll work a little bit on teaching how to stabilize your torso while you use your arm or whatever it is. And then they go back and, and play like right away, you know, they don't have sort of time to like, okay, and now I'll train and get all ready. Right. It's like, okay, it feels better. I'm going to play. And then they would come back feeling better, performing better, 
than they had before the injury. And without doing all that big stuff that they'd been used to. So, and we see it everywhere with knees and and backs and everything that, so that, that sort of really clicked. And, And now I think it's, it's pretty common in strength and conditioning, but it's like, yeah, unless we have those, that small inner muscle, you know, that, that interior armor working, we can be as strong as we want, you know, and it, and it won't matter. I used to, I loved working with football players too. And so if it was a shoulder, I'd love to get a guy just doing like a simple push up on a stability ball because <laughs> it yes. you know, you always ask them like, how much can you bench? And, and cause they love to tell you how much they can bench, you know, yeah. and, and I can bench so much, you know, and, and then you say, okay, well, so this shouldn't be very hard. Cause it's like, you're on a ball. So you're elevated and it's just a push up. And, right. you know, as soon as they bend their elbows, it, you know, it jumps to life <laughs> and they, they would say, whoa, you know, they really, they get it right away. So yeah, I love that, it. that's what that's all about. I love it. Okay. So the goalie position is definitely unique in the biomechanics that are required to be successful. So how does that dictate or impact your assessment process? Uh, a lot of looking at hips. Okay. Because not just like a baseball pitcher, not everyone has the shoulder to be a pitcher. Yep. Doesn't mean they can't be a pitcher. Yeah. <laughs> but but your shoulder is not designed to be a pitcher. Right. It's the same for a goalie. So they need that hip internal rotation to go in. It's called the butterfly position so that they sort of have their pads flat on the ice. Plus, there's some new positions now that is like one pad is in the butterfly, but the skate is against the post. So it's kind of wedged in there. And then they lean their body over that. So they're in internal rotation, extreme internal rotation adduction. Yeah. Uh, and which again, it's like, yeah, you're like, your hip is not designed to really do that. Right. So looking at how the hip moves, because they don't realize that their hips can't just move in any direction they wish. Right. So I think part of it too is identifying is there a limitation in their hip mobility? Okay. Is that limitation actually a mobility issue or is it a structural issue? Is there already a bony impingement? Or is it maybe a capsular restriction that some manual therapy can can free up? But figuring out what's going on and then working within the confines of what their body can do. So that's that. I think that's probably the biggest thing that impacts how I how I assess a goalie. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I was so proud of myself because I was doing some homework and I found the term butterfly and I was like, oh, now I feel like a real like hockey insider. I know what that that position's <laughs> called. But, you know, so when you're evaluating somebody and you're looking at like hip rotation and all that, I mean, how common is it to see like FAI or impingements and that sort of thing in this population? Is it fairly common or do they are they on the other side where it's not as common because genetically they have kind of the right kind of hips to be successful? It's really common. Okay. It's really common. And I think it's it's only going to get worse. So, well, yeah, there will be, you know, 18, 19 year old goalies will need to have surgery for hip impingement. Oh my God. And I think it's there's still so little understanding. Like I, I, I can't you know, I'm, I'm not I didn't grow up in baseball, but I'm guessing it's probably what baseball was like maybe 25 years ago when they didn't realize like, oh, that's actually, you know, not great to throw right. like for a kid to be whipping <laughs> like 200 pitches. Right. And they, they, they will tell you, the goalies will tell you, or parents of kids will tell you, well, their hips don't hurt. No, their hips feel fine. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, it, it's going to feel fine until it doesn't feel fine, you know, until maybe, right. they, and that's a, that's a problem too, because a lot of times the wear and tear adds up to the point of no return, you know, to where they can't play anymore when maybe they're 21 and, and yeah. they're really getting, if they're good enough and they last that long and they have really good opportunities and now it's like, you know, you're going to be out for the better part of a season, if not a full season. So mm. it's, there's a, there's a, it's a big problem and I think it's going to get worse. Yeah. That's, that's awful to hear. So when you're evaling somebody, and again, I'm kind of caught up on this, this assessment idea right now, you're looking at their hips, you're checking, obviously, to see if they've got impingements, that sort of thing. Are you doing anything as far as like strength, power, explosiveness? Like, is that part of the equation? Or is that something you're looking at? Because what I would assume is there's some sort of model that you have, right, of like, how somebody should move and everybody's got their own unique traits. 
But do you have like models or like numbers that you're looking for people to hit? Or is it just kind of like, I'm just going to take each person individually and see what they can do? It is more that one. I don't have yeah. sort of a cookie cutter. It's more trying to figure out where do we need to start? And are there some maybe irreducible limitations that we just going to need to work around? Okay. So I don't, yeah, there isn't kind of a not specific number that I'm, that I'm looking for, but you know, I'll, I'll, I am interested in their dorsiflexion too, you know, side yeah. to side difference in dorsiflexion is an important one. And then just to like, can they, like, I won't typically do a full FMS, but I'll do like hurdle step, just like, Hey, can they, can they stabilize their pelvis and what's their active range of motion? It's interesting, Mike, if, like if we do, I'll do a lot of the FRC stuff, like mm -hmm. the Dr. Spina's FRC stuff. And if I'm at a camp and, and it'll be like a prospect camp or some like good, good goalies, good athletes. And I'll ask them just to do like a hip cars. Like the, they won't, they won't even approximate full range of motion. And even if I'm right there coaching, like, no, no, like bring your knee, like as big a circle as you can, you know, and, and, and they won't until I come and bring my hand, you know, and say, well, can you bring your knee up to touch my hand? And they can. So it's almost like there's an amnesia too, or, you know, that, yeah. that they, they never get out there in training. They don't even know what that range of motion is. And so that's something in training we work on a lot. That's cool. That's cool. So I'm going to kind of set this up here a little bit. Like I've worked with a ton of goalkeepers in soccer and some of the big focuses or big foci, I guess would probably be the better way to put it, are like being light on your feet, being agile, being explosive. You know, obviously they've got a big goal face to cover not only side to side, but vertically as well. So when it comes to training your hockey players, what are some of the things that you feel like are most important for you to work on or for you to address to make them a better athlete? For me to address is, is their mobility in that end range. Okay. So getting them acquainted with that end range, getting them strong in that end range, because this, a lot of them still think of their, of training their flexibility. So just stretching. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. I just need to stretch. And so building that strength in the end range or strength at length is key. I think this part about vertical agility, recovering from the butterfly back to their skates. And, and usually that's, or not a lot of the time that's to go somewhere. So that's not right. just standing up, it's driving, getting to where you want to go. So building that, that kind of power. So that's another cool thing I discovered when I started experimenting myself and playing myself is that top, top down squatting is very different from bottom up. Squatting. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, doing bottom up strength patterns, starting in like the bottom position of a split squat or starting in half kneeling sure. and then coming, coming up with control. Those are some big elements that I work on. And then, you know, from a goalie coaching perspective, which is in my area, there's a huge amount of positioning too. And, and soccer might be similar, but with a hockey you know, depending on where the puck is and how far it is. And, you know, it's what the puck sees, not what the shooter sees and how much net is exposed and knowing, you know, exactly where to be to make that net behind you as small as possible. Yes. Yes. No, that's awesome. And I guess I had never thought of that. Like generally, again, in soccer, you're on your feet and you have that, that luxury of using the stretch shortening cycle versus what you <laughs> just described. I mean, you could be camped out in the bottom and then have to rapidly explode up. And like you said, not just get into a position, but then like make an explosive move out of it. Like that's got to be really hard. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And and it's, it is such a small space, right? You know, like a, like a soccer goalie, you know, there's going to be a shot, maybe a rebound, maybe a second shot. Yeah. But, you know, with a goalie, it's going to be pass, 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 shot, rebound, pass, you know. It's, right, it's, it's yeah. Like quick. you said, the tight quarters – yeah, there's got to be a massive reactive component to that just from them, from their, from their end, right? Like being able to oh, yeah. respond and react very quickly. That's crazy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it seems like obviously flexibility and mobility are pretty important for goalies, especially with regards to IR. So is this something that you're putting an emphasis on directly in training and, and maybe on the flip side, and I think you kind of already alluded to this, that strength at length, but what else are you doing to kind of injury proof these athletes and keep them healthy? Yeah. And it's like, I just think of, I think Mike, Mike Boyle is probably the guy I heard it from first is just like injury prevention is good training. Like yes. good training is your injury prevention training. So it is getting them strength at length, 
building stamina. So because also they have to hold, you know, these positions like that loaded position, you know, for a long time that gets fatiguing. So building that building that rapid lengthening from different positions, recovering to different positions, I think just trying to not trying to just do like, oh, this is what you do on the ice. We're going to try to do that off the ice, but right. trying to pull out those elements that, that increase the risk, you know? So yeah, a guy might be in his butterfly and then have to kick his leg out to, to try to make a save. Right. And so, you know, okay, can, how can we get that rapid lengthening or train you to be able to do that rapid lengthening without tearing your groin? Or when, <laughs> I, when, I, when I watch videos of goalies tearing their groin, which they're prone to do, a lot of times it isn't just that leg kicking out. It's a leg kicking out plus a reach or a rotation. You know, it's that chain gets wound up and the yeah. groin is just the, what pays the price. So, okay, well then we need to work this pattern to, to try to teach it to tolerate more load. Gotcha. Gotcha. So could you kind of like put together, like, I, I think what I'm trying to, to understand is, could you give me like what a typical training day would look like? And maybe, you know, we all know like you... And again, I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but you're going to work on mobility. You're going to do some strength based stuff. But could you maybe give us some some ideas as to what makes it different from a more traditional strength training program? Like you highlighted the part where it's going to have a concentric focus. Like, I think that's huge and that's very helpful. Like what other differences might you see between this and maybe what you would consider a more just standard or general strength and conditioning template? Yeah, and that's a good question because my philosophy right now anyway is that a lot of the things are the same yeah that they still need to be and and depends on the level but they still need to be just strong explosive mobile yes. athletes and so really like maybe 30 percent is different so we might we might do instead of a front squat and, and we'll use a front squat you know i'm just saying like for example, on sure. this day, for example, instead of that, we might do a squat lateral so that mm. we're moving in that frontal plane because also a goalie moves in a frontal plane yep. more than they really move front to back. So we might use squat lateral. We might do, you know, instead of just a standing cable adduction, we might do like a half kneeling with one foot on a slide board or a glider okay. and do our adduction, abduction that way. You know, th those kind of things. In agility, we're going to spend a lot more time in the frontal plane. We're going to spend more time adding that vertical element. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that's helpful just because yeah, I think we're always trying to better understand, you know, the differences and the nuances between positions and between sports. But like you alluded to, so much of what we do like, and I think you said this in one of your videos that I was watching a while back, you're like, I'm not an on ice hockey coach, right? Like, I'm not telling you how to be a better goalie, I'm giving you the physical tools. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes we get caught up in that trap of how do I make it more specific, more specific, but it's like, in the gym, the best thing we can do is keep it general and give the coach a better base and a better athlete so that when they go back, they've got better physical tools to work with. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, I think a mistake is to try to make it look exactly the same. Yes. You know, we might get into some of those positions or work on tolerance in those positions, but it's, yeah, it's like you see on, in, you know, on social media, like yes. people just like, and into the butterfly and you know, out of the butterfly. <laughs> and it's like, okay, that that's, that's not really it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not how it should be. Working. That on the ice. Yeah. I, I love it. Okay. So not to totally switch topics here, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on being a female that works primarily in professional sports and around very high level athletes. And not only that, you're not only around professional athletes, but you're around what I would consider to be a fairly male centric sport in hockey. So if a young female is listening in and she wants to follow in your footsteps, what advice would you give her to be successful? I think don't think about it. Yeah. <laughs> be, be really be really good at your, like put your energy and your effort into being as good as you can at your job. Because if you're getting results for athletes, doesn't matter. Then, then it doesn't matter your gender. And I'm sure there've been people who've chosen not to train with me because of my gender, but I've honestly never felt it's been a roadblock. I, yeah, I grew up a tomboy and I learned from the boys in my neighborhood. I was very lucky that 
you know what, if I could throw the ball far and right into the, a guy's hands, I'd get to be the quarterback. And <laughs> if I could keep the hockey ball out of the net, I could be the goalie. Yep. So, you know, and, and it's it's been the same in my career. It's just, I don't think about it. I, I never would use it as an excuse. I, and, and maybe I've just been lucky, but yeah. No, I love that. And I've got a lot of, you know, young females that listen to this show and they're always interested, like, like they have this passion or this drive to work at the highest level. So I think hearing from people such as yourself, Rachel Balkovec is somebody who we're going to get on eventually. We've had some hiccups trying to get her on. She's a very busy gal. But, you know, it's great to hear from people such as yourself that are working at the highest levels and to hear that message, because I think sometimes they want to put themselves in a box and not realize, hey, look, if you're skilled, if you've got the talent and if you, you know, carry yourself the right way, you can absolutely do this at a high level yourself. And and I probably put in 10 years before I got working with, yeah. you know, elite level athletes. Like, yeah, like I would phone that gym every night after eight o'clock and, you know, yeah. okay, you've got someone at six in the morning, two in the afternoon and seven, eight and nine at night. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. yeah. That's the part nobody wants to talk about, right? But that, no, yeah, I just want to work with athletes. I just want <laughs> like, to work with athletes. So that's why I asked you how long you've done online because everybody, you know, sees the Instagram ad. Oh, have a, a stable full of online clients in the next three months. Like, man, I've been doing <laughs> online coaching for like 14 years now. And, you know, it's just not, it doesn't work like that. It takes time. Yeah. So. Yeah. And you don't, you don't make money while you're sleep. Well, you might make money while you're sleeping, but you're working 50 hours a week. <laughs> that's right. To, to make money while you sleep. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Okay. So big question time. If you could alter the space-time continuum and give young Maria Mountain one piece of advice about training and or life, what would it be? What springs to mind is what my dad, the advice, or, or maybe it's not even advice, but what my dad used to say to me every time I had like a crushing defeat and I always like kind of wanted to slap him when he'd say <laughs> it, but he was always right. And it's that you never know when you're being lucky. So, and he said it to me, you know, and it applies to everything, you know, your grade 11 boyfriend dumps you, you never know when you're being lucky. Yeah, <laughs> you know, okay. But yeah, and I, I remember when I, I didn't get into medical school and, and I come from a family of physicians and my dad said, you know, you never know when you're being lucky. And I didn't like to hear it at the time, but he's just, he's absolutely right because this, this was this is how I was put on earth to help people. And so I think that just remember that even, even with this experience we're going through right now, we're, we're doing this during the lockdown. And it's like, this can be an opportunity if you just look for it. Absolutely. I love that. That's very unique. I've never heard that before, but I'm going to start using that with my kids. We'll see how that goes over. I'll let you yeah, know. Yeah, just, just make me like have your guard up. That's yeah, right. it's, you don't love to hear it as a kid, but yeah, my dad was a very wise guy. Huh, I'll have to check that out. Okay, last but not least, we've got our lightning round. So four fairly short questions. Your answers can be as long or short as you'd like, okay? That sounds fair, yeah. All right, number one, <laughs> what's your career highlight so far as a coach? Okay, yeah, what springs to mind first is actually not hockey related, but I trained some figure skaters in Canada. People will know them. They're Virtue and Moyer, and they won their first Olympic gold medal in 2010. And that that was, yeah, that was a thrill because there's just, there's no room for, you know, you can't make any little mistake. And they were very young. They were the youngest to ever win a gold medal. And that oh, wow. was just a thrill. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Congrats. I didn't know that. That's mm -hmm. exciting. Okay, number two, and I think I may know your answer to this now based on our conversation, but I'm going to ask anyway. Do you believe in a goalie-specific program? I, I think there need to be goalie-specific exercises and movement patterns within the program. So I, I don't think it has to be all, you know, pixie Goalies. fairy dust. Yeah, <laughs> but but I think there, there, there definitely need to be things to prepare a goalie for to do what they need to do. Gotcha. I love it. Number three. What's the hardest part of being an off-ice goalie coach? To me, the hardest part is it's a frustration that goalies don't seem to understand that they need to prepare as athletes, and that means everything. I get a lot of, I need to be quicker. What what should I do to have more power? You know, it's right. like, well, well, can you move? Can you stabilize? Do you have the you know or right. or I need to do the splits or I need to do you know they just want to 
like a slight, I'm always saying like, this isn't a smorgasbord. Like you don't <laughs> go in and just have a little of this and a little of that. And then you get where you want to go. It's, it's, you gotta, you gotta take every step. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Last but not least, number four, what's next for Maria Mountain? What are you working on? What are you excited about? When we get released from lockdown, what are you going to be doing? Well, I'm excited to get back on the ice like everyone else when we yes. get released from lockdown. I'm excited. Hopefully, I'll be able to still go to some of the camps that I'm going to run the off-ice training for this summer. But it's more the same. It, 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 like this, yeah, this really is going to be my life's work. And, you know, I've enjoyed traveling to some countries in Europe to help their goalies, and I want to do more of that. And it's just, yeah, every, every, every day I'm thinking of how can I help more. Yeah, I love it. I love your passion and your enthusiasm for this. So, Maria, you've been amazing to chat with today. I'm glad we finally got to meet, even though it's virtually. Where can my listeners find out more about you and all the great work that you're doing? I'm pretty active on Instagram. I'm just at Goalie Training. If you're more of a website person, it's GoalieTrainingPro.com. Perfect. I will make sure we get both those links in the show notes so people can follow you. And again, Maria, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was great having you. Yeah, it was great to chat with you. Yeah, you, I've, I've followed your stuff for years and I've learned a ton from you. So I'm happy to happy to chat. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, my friends, that does it for this week's show with Maria. Sincerely hope you enjoyed it. I think she and I have traveled in similar circles for many, many years, probably closing in on 15 years now. So it was great for us to finally connect. And I feel like with shows like this, like just look at our last three shows where you had Alex talking about motorsports, you had Stefan talking about cricket, now you've got Maria talking specifically about hockey goalies. Even if you don't work in these realms or in these domains, you can still learn so much about other people's processes. And when you learn their processes, then you can take that and apply it to your own. Maybe their generality to you helps you become a better coach because Look, we're all specialists to some degree, but I feel like with these episodes where you are taking a different specialist, you can pull things out and use those generalities to make yourself a better trainer or coach. So with that being said, Project 1K per day is in full effect, trying to get 30K downloads over the next couple months. So anything you can do to help support the show would be greatly appreciated. If you're not already subscribed, do that now. We're on all the major platforms. If you are subscribed, you're awesome. Thank you. Please share one of your favorite episodes. Go back, listen to some of your favorites. I mean, just coming off the top of my head, Stuart McGill, awesome episodes. Chris Chase, awesome episodes. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. Eric Cressy, Joel Jameson, Lee Taft, Bill Hartman. Like, the list is virtually infinite. I mean, we're over 200 shows now. So find your favorite, Buddy Morris. Go back to episode 12. If you haven't listened to it, I don't even get to ask questions. That's how big of a role Buddy Morris is on. So anyway, find your favorite episode, send it to a friend, family member, loved one, athlete, client, anybody that you think would benefit from it. I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. So my friend, that does it for this week's episode. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back soon with our next episode. Take care.